welcome to 1991 Movie Rewind, a podcast where we watch and review every movie released in 1991, from the all-time greatest classics to the critically panned and everything in between. We will rediscover forgotten fan favorites and uncover hidden gems as we explore the depths of direct video Join us in our celebration of the fun, unique, and diverse films of this highly underrated year. This week, we watched Cool as Ice. <laughs> Cool as Ice, Vanilla Ice plays a rapper named Johnny that bounces from show to show and from girl to girl. On his way to the next town, he and his crew get stuck in a small town when one of their motorcycles breaks down. While they wait for it to be fixed, Johnny finds himself mixed in with a local girl whose family might be in danger. Screenplay by David Sten, directed by David Kellogg, and released on October 18th, 1991. Have you seen Cool as Ice before? Yes, and I saw this in the theater. <laughs> is this the first movie that you've seen in the theater of the ones that we covered? Um, from it's one what, of. Them. Yeah, from what I remember, I do remember going to the theater and watching this movie. Okay. On purpose? Like, you know, like, were you like a fan of Vanilla Ice and you're like, I have to go see this? Or was it just like, eh, there's nothing else this is the movie we're choosing today? Um, I mean, probably, I think, so I went with a friend, and I think maybe the friend was more of a cool as I, or a Vanilla Ice fan. They were the, uh, I don't, do, do Vanilla Ice fans have, like, a nickname? Like, like no, I have ice, no idea. Ice, ice, ice babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the babies. Um, I have no idea. I mean, we were, like, 11, and it was probably, and then I was surprised that this is like a PG-13 movie, but whatever. So that was, like, from what I remember is maybe we just decided to go see a movie, and that was the only movie to see. Okay. So it wasn't your fandom that brought you no, to the theater? No, yeah, I wasn't like, I need to see this day one type of thing. It yeah. was just, I remember going to the theater and seeing this Okay. as a young girl. I, I remember that it released. I never watched it. I considered watching it for, you know, like the camp factor over the yeah. years. Even back then, like basically right when it released, it was like, oh, this is going to be cheesy garbage. Yeah. Right. So like there was that appeal to it if you like that type of stuff, which I always have. So that would be the only reason to do it. But, I, you know, it just never crossed my path until now. I think the only thing I knew about this movie was, you know, get with the zero and you know, drop the zero and get with the hero mm -hmm. that's it <laughs> other than that i just knew it was a movie that had vanilla ice in the star and rolling <laughs> nothing about the plot or anything looking at it now i think it's very clear and it probably was clear at the time that this was really just made to cash in on the fad that was vanilla ice oh yeah and there's an argument to be made that the fad was almost over by the time this movie came out, which is probably why it flopped so hard in the box office, or partially. Um, I don't know. You were I probably mean, more not... ingrained on the music scene back then. I know he released yeah. albums since, and he's like continuing to put out music to some degree. Right. So. I think, I mean, it's not really, I don't know who this movie is for, because yeah, it's not. Yeah, that's one of my meant... talking points. <laughs> it's like, who is this meant for? <laughs> Because it's not really meant for kids. And then you know he did, like, ninja rap. Yeah. So you think that, like, kids would want to go because of the Ninja Turtles to see this. But it's... The subject matter is not childlike at all. But it's, it's packaged... But kind of. <laughs> it's packaged like a Saturday cheesy. morning cartoon. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's that's what I wrote down, too, is, like, who is this movie for? And I think, like, if we're talking in terms of characters in the movie, it is meant for the Tommies, the little brothers in this, who are, like, sitting around playing Tecmo Bowl and Super Mario Bros. 3. Right. You know, and who, like, clearly when, you know, Johnny comes to the door, he's, like, completely enamored with him. Right. Much more than anyone else in the family, including the love interest. 
And it's like, oh my god, you're the coolest person right. ever. Right, I think... They're catering to that kid. We're spo- yeah, we're supposed to be like... Yeah, that. we are That's, supposed to be Tommy. We are supposed... I guess, like... Yes. I but which shows me, what the fil- filmmakers thought yeah. of the audience. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, as an eleven year old watching this, I was like, "Oh, he's so cool!" I never thought Vanilla Ice was cool, <laughs> so no. I was just like, "The movie is fun in a way." <laughs> it is. It is. I <laughs> like think I don't very hate safe it, to say. but it's like I think it's because you got these like quirky characters and like that quirky house and you know um it's, it's basically like multiple motorcycles and yeah. yeah it's like seven different music videos put into like some random plot yeah it's it's fun in the same we can compare this to a whole bunch of movies and I actually kind of want to a little bit um i mean the first thing that comes to mind is doc hollywood oh first thing that came to my mind was rock and roll high school forever because oh. it's the same type of, like, childish, like, playfulness, not only in terms of, like, the characters and, like, what some of them are doing, you know, because you have, like, the the crew, like, making their peanut butter and pickle sandwiches and mm-hmm. their, like, goofy things and there's the wacky neighbors who are, like, dancing and, you know, whatever. All that kind of stuff that's happening, which is reminiscent to me of Rock and Roll High School Forever, where it's just, you know, carefree, just fun, mm-hmm. goofy behavior that doesn't make any sense within the context of the movie, but it's there just to, you know, get a giggle out of you or a smile yeah um so that's where my head goes and also you know obviously with the camera work too where it's you know a lot of canted angles it's trying to be very 90s in that same way that we saw with uh, new jack city yes that's okay. the new jack city <laughs> <laughs> all over the place the 90s was like the same style presented just, in different yeah, ways <laughs> different levels of expertise yeah it's experimenting with like camera angles yes there was a lot of that of you know the the cameras were starting to become a little bit more fluid and 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 more handheld than they had been in the past at this time um you know you didn't have to build like specific rigs to do a specific movement you could just have somebody hold it and that wasn't always the case um anyway the um i think the other one that we could probably compare it to is purple rain oh yeah i thought of well, I first thought of Doc Hollywood because... Oh, yeah. You know, Why did you think of Doc Hollywood? Just because, because of the subject matter and the PG rating? No, because it's, you know, they, they're they in... They're from, I don't even know, a city. They don't really say where. Yeah, I, I should probably... Like, the summary that I mentioned, that's me just piecing shit together. Because <laughs> the movie does not explain if Vanilla Ice's crew or whatever, if they are actually professionals touring that's, the company, yeah. what, whatever... I thought they were from that town. No, for a long I thought time. I thought they were just going from city to city, and the bike breaks down in a small town where it's obviously like they're from like Footloose era because it's like people are still dressed up like they're from the fifties, like when they go to that sugar shack. I guess, but yeah, yeah, but like the, the and then farm you have these go four... to right on the start like it's it's a hip painted barn with all kinds of like cool be- you know it'd be like an art museum okay you know, uh, it's like a... but it's just like these four guy or not i shouldn't say guy four people four people there's, there is one girl there's, there's princess in the there, woman which i don't think they ever say by name but she's yeah. credited as princess so you have these four people come in he's like you know rapping and stuff and people are like what the hell is this and then you know people start liking it but i i just got that because you know, they stay there for what, like a week while the motorcycle gets fixed and then they leave. That's kind of like Doc Hollywood stayed in that small town until his car was able that's, yeah, I didn't, to be fixed. I didn't think about that. I think that's a fair comparison. That's yeah. That was the first thing I, I was like, oh, we got another Doc Hollywood. But then, yeah, I also thought of Purple Rain because, I mean, Purple I think it's Rain, trying to be like Purple <laughs> yeah, but it can't. <laughs> Even and though Purple Rain plot wise is not great. It's not a good okay, Purple Rain is not a good movie. Like in It's terms just of, good like, to story. me because I am a f- fan of Prince. Yes. It's it's an amazing Soundtrack. quasi concert film. Yes. With but okay, the the stuff that happens in between the musical numbers in is Purple not Rain good. is not good, but it's at least like interesting and quirky. 
and even though it doesn't land it's still like fascinating to watch because it's just prints and like you know it's, what is he actually you know you're trying to wrap your mind around whatever visual elements he's putting together mm -hmm. vanilla ice on the other hand I, I think what fails about this movie is that there's actually only a couple vanilla ice songs it's not all of his stuff in here no. and so it doesn't work as a concert film because he's not performing all that much even though music is like non-stop in this thing um it's not all his music and then all the stuff in between doesn't have that potential depth it doesn't have that artistry that prince's stuff has even if it doesn't really connect with us it's still artistry that's being pre presented you know like mm -hmm. with the little you know little puppet thing that prince had in the dressing room for instance oh. um but like here is just there's no depth he's exposing vanilla ice is exposing himself to have absolutely no depth no substance to him you know like where are you from i'm from around you're from yeah. around yup yup end of conversation so i mean like you know i don't know, I know. <laughs> so, like, you don't even have like the visual uh, you have visual stimuli but like I mean, it's he almost... sort of explains. He's like, I'm here now. Like, he just lives yeah. in the moment. I, I understand it's yeah, kind of dumb. It's really trying to be deep, but there's nothing there. He's like, Absolutely. I'm just living in the moment. So wherever I'm from is where I am now. Or like That's that what he's, scene when, he's like, like he... I'm here now. This is where I'm from or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, the character motivations just do not make any sense at all. But yeah, I mean, I will say the the movie is again visually interesting. It has a yeah. lot going for it in that respect, but there's no cohesive structure, and I think a big part of why that is is because of the director David Kellogg. He's mostly a commercial and music video director. Uh, he's done some Playboy videos as well, but like in terms of like movies, it's like his two biggest movies is this and the 1999 Inspector Gadget. Mm. Other than that, like, he's doing, like, commercials. Like, he did the Jerry Seinfeld Superman American Express commercials that okay. were huge, like, Super Bowl ads. He's done music videos for, like, Expose and Heavy D and Taylor Dane, I'll Be Sure, the Michael Jackson Jam video is his. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's he's done a lot of music video work. And this is basically just a bunch of music video styles that are shoehorned into a potential plot structure. And so there's no cohesive, like, style. There's no cohesive visual look. It's just from scene to scene, it's something different. Like, you have um, the opening title credits. is basically like a CNC Music Factory video. Oh, Where yeah. they're in, like, an abandoned factory. He's rapping the theme song, Cool as Ice. And he has, like, you know, the exposed cage light that he's singing into. Mm -hmm. And everybody's dancing around him. And then you go into, like, another scene where they're introducing the love interest's family. And it's... You know, this frantic thing where they speed up the film to make everybody, you know, running around the tables and looking at papers and, yeah, yeah. you know, dancing while setting for dinner. Yeah. You know, there's, I don't know what, <laughs> you know, those things don't mesh. Right? right. Yeah, that's just. It's like little vignettes that are connected like, by that plot. That was like a Black Hole Sun type video. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it kind of was. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I at some point you just kind of want Beefus and Butthead to start making fun of this thing. But, I mean, I think it makes sense that, you know, David Kalag, he's good at putting together these, you know, well-received three to four minute things or less. And so he just did that a bunch of times. And then there's nothing to connect it. Uh, and then we've talked about this before as well, but it, just in the filmmaking side, we have Janusz Kaminski as the cinematographer again. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, we saw his work in Terror Within 2, which we talked about, um, and we'll see him again three more times. He was busy this year, but uh, just to remind people, the cinematographer for this movie is an Oscar winner for Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan. I, just yeah, a couple years later. I just want to know the, like, how he came from this to what he does now. Yeah, in just a couple short years. I, I mean, honestly... I understand more watching this as to why he went on to work with other people than I did when watching Terror Within 2. Terror Within 2 is the most I generic feel, yeah, thing I, in the world. This has style. This has, this, like, flair. Yeah, he was just like, I need a job, and I'll just do this thing. Oh, yeah. 
But if I was a cinematographer offered any movie, I'd probably oh, take yeah. it. Right? <laughs> but wouldn't you want to like go, like use your artistry, like you know, like salmon berries, like try to do something like that or something? Well, yeah, but there's only X number of those available. And, you know, this, this was meant to be a big movie, right? This They wanted this to I be mean, a this, huge thing. I mean, this, I understood, the cinematography in this was better, and I understood, and I I can see his, like, vision growing, I guess. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming Terror Within probably was made, f- I don't know, I don't know which one was made first. But, I mean, obviously part of it's due to the director and what their vision is. And David Kellogg had that visual eye from his work in music videos and stuff like that um that he could bring in and say here do this you know like let's get these weird angles like let's catch this scenery let's try to frame the shot in this specific way and i think you know in that way the movie is fun to watch the other way that it's fun to watch is just how bad the acting is and how unmotivated the characters yeah. are. But that is also what kind of frustrates you as, like, a, a, in a legitimate film sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but not all the acting is bad. I, I mean, okay, Vanilla Ice, yes. Yeah. Of course, like, he won the Razzie for uh, for this thing. For worst actor. For, for worst new star. Oh. Uh, not, not worst actor overall. He was nominated for that, but Kevin Costner took that award for Robin Hood. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> um, but he won. He won the Razzie for best or worst new star. Um, his love interest, Kristen Minter, was also nominated for worst new star, but lost to Vanilla Ice. I don't think Kristen Minter was bad. No. She was just in a bad situation. I she was given just, bad dialogue. Yeah, I think they were bad just... character choices trying to have fun in this movie yeah i I think yeah and like making fun of themselves like we're we know this is not gonna do great maybe so let's just have a good time and do whatever and that can lead to more success too right you know if you have people who are having fun on screen that can translate to the audience and it can make it more fun and people will see it vanilla ice just seemed kind of checked out in a way he seemed like he was so intent on keeping up this specific almost like stoic image of you know this super cool guy Mm. they didn't have like any actual emotions at any time he didn't have any i don't know motivation to do what he was doing he was just sort of i never got the sense that he was trying to do anything other than sleep with this girl and then move on to the next town i mean that seemed that's probably what that was he the usually initial. does. Oh yeah, that was the initial purpose, right? Like but, he finds a cute girl in each town, and you know probably hooks up with them, and then goes to the next town. But then at some point they fall in love, I guess. But they don't. The chemistry doesn't work. Right. And maybe it's partly because the main scenes where we're supposed to see their relationship blossom in this one afternoon where they go to this abandoned construction site, or not abandoned, but you know. It's just, yeah. And, and Sparsely new... worked construction site. Right. <laughs> um, and then, like, random open fields and stuff. Um, again, it's like a music video where they're not... They're dancing around all these, like, wooden planks and they're looking at the cameras and laughing. Mm-hmm. Instead of looking at each other and laughing, they're looking at us, the audience. Well, it's as if the person yeah, that's like looking at them... Yeah. But it doesn't work. I don't... I, we did not feel, or I did not, I'm not going to talk for you, but I did not feel their romantic connection in those scenes. Did you get the sense that they're, like, becoming more connected and, you know, intertwined? It just felt like a weird, like, eh, it's a jaunty, fun afternoon, and then we're going to have some lustful scenes on the bike and in the field. Right. It's not like, oh, now I love you because of how deeply we're connecting. When, yeah, they don't even know like what exactly were they connecting on. Well, he's from around, yup yup. <laughs> but they don't <laughs> so, show like, them that's... have like an actual deep conversation besides him saying wherever I'm from is where or wherever I'm at is where I'm from type of thing. Yeah, I wish I would have written more stuff, but that he says that I was trying to wrap my head around like what yeah, I was trying to wrap my head around like what what 
was just said? Why was this just said? I mean, she talks I, more about her, because he even asks her, what's it like living in this small town? Yeah. And she's like, oh, I like it. And he's like, really? Like, because well, he's, he's probably like, been around, a quote, around. Well, yeah, and she's like, never the, left that town. One of the deep things that he said that is supposed to make you as an audience sort of, like, feel pity for him. He's like, well, what's it like having a family, basically? Right. You know, like, she's what's like, it like, I like it. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, having a family is cool. Like, oh. It's like, I Go I didn't know them. what that's like. I go from here to there. Yeah. But wouldn't he think his friends are his family? You'd think so, but he definitely doesn't treat them that way. He just leaves them all to stay in this stupid <laughs> in this house, this right. barn, but I the think... entire time that he's like off gallivanting well, all, with this girl. All his friends are like, oh, he's going to do whatever he's going to do and chase after whatever girl yeah, so we'll for the day. Yeah, so bored while this guy who pretends so like he can fix a bike try to entertain our bike. own selves by making a castle, a, like a house of cards and right. stuff like that. And dance around the house and in the streets. It's so weird and really nothing makes sense. I mean, he travels with them from city to city. Wouldn't they be close like a family yeah you'd think so i mean we're, we're kind of all over the place with this but the movie's also all over the place yeah. but like when nick who is cat okay we never even said that the girlfriend the love interest name is cat or kathy yeah that's Kristen mentor's character boyfriend nick mm -hmm. uh gets super jealous possessive typical asshole prep dude right yeah um and you know, to sort of get back at Vanilla Ice for dancing with this girl at the Sugar Shack Club, which is just full of nerds. I mean, it's like... The most crazy nerd stereotypes try, you've ever seen in your life. It's trying to be like this 50s peach pit or like the Max or something yes. type place where teens hang. And they're all like dressed like they That's what I was thinking. Like, this is just like a footloose type of town or something and then these people come in and rap and everyone's like whoa i've never heard rap music basically but yeah <laughs> so then, that makes nick jealous because johnny pulls cat into the right, crowd but and I they've think already she's had just, like prior yeah they interactions had interaction and um well, yeah the, and so nick starts beating up on sir d's bike sir d is like one of the people in the crew and Boy, what a weird scene that is. So, like, he's he's protecting his family, quote-unquote, in that respect because he's protecting the bike. Right. Which, I don't know where Sir D, Princess, and, and what is it, Deezer? Deezer, yeah. I don't know where they are because it's at the freaking farm. And there's, like, two people walking, watching on the porch while all this is happening. It's, like, four prep dudes <laughs> against Vanilla Ice. He stops them. Of course, he's able to defeat all four of them and walk away. Doesn't go in to say, "Hey, Sir D, right? Your, your bike your, is your like bike been, has been beat up." And then I was like baseball bats or well, something. Well, even to go back, like after they do their performance at whatever warehouse, they are riding their bikes through this small town. One of the guys, I don't even know, is it Deezer? His bike completely just, just breaks stops down working. in the middle of. The street. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We're in the name. The name of the character is Jazz. Jazz. Oh, Deez played, by, played Deezer by Deezer D. D. Okay. Sorry. So yeah. Jazz's bike breaks down, and then that's when they find this quirky little shop. Which isn't a shop. It's just a house yeah, along but, the road. And the guys. But like, it doesn't even like show them like look up. Where can I get my bike repaired? No, it's they just, just like, get stopped just... by this this farmer dude. Who thinks that they're trying to sell, like, I sell guess he's, it? like, meeting somebody to buy a bike. And he's like, okay, I guess I'll buy it for you from for $500 or something like that. And, and they like, get into this like, weird conversation. And it's like, no, this is a broken bike. Like, we're just trying to get out of this town. whatever. And he's yeah. like, oh, well, I know how to fix bikes. And they're like, okay. It's not a repair shop. Like, clearly not a repair shop. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> it, it's a really weird scene. And all the scenes with that family... Uh, the farmer and, and the wife there, right. Roscoe and May. Um, it's weird. But, <laughs> so, 
that couple is trying to fix Jazz's bike, and they said it would take a day, but it's more than a day. Because they don't actually know what they're doing. Right. But meanwhile, you know, they're just, like, stuck in this town, and wouldn't they would wouldn't they also have to fix the beat up bike sir d's bike as well because is that also broken i don't know were they watching on the porch when it happened and they were going to fix that one at night i was like well they would also (laughs) have to get that bike fixed yeah so i don't and then there's nothing about the stay there longer or something yeah nothing about the timelines adds up because i don't know like the first and then the one thing that really bothered me was like in the very beginning where they're just riding their bikes on the highway and Vanilla Ice sees, you know, Kathy on her horse. Right. And he's got to do this like dumb ass move to try to be like cool. Yeah. To show off or whatever. So he does this fucking pop a wheelie thing over the fence in front of her while she's riding this horse and the horse gets scared and she falls off i was like she could have died yeah that's the, that's their me cute right i was like, like that's, that's their introduction if that happened to me i would automatically be like yo I'm, i almost died and you almost like killed my horse i would be extremely mad i wouldn't be like i mean i know she punches him stuff but and she sees him later on but i would be like you almost killed me. Right. Yeah. Th- again, character motivation is not the thing. Yeah. So he, <laughs> he he gets punched, which is appropriate, like in the stomach or shoulder. Yeah. Or she punches like, him. He's simple. like, you hit pretty well for a girl. Yeah. And and like, I was he like, gets okay. Offended. It's like, what'd you do that for? Basically. He's like, dude. You almost fucking killed me. <laughs> <laughs> like that, like that bothered me in the beginning. Yeah. That's a really terrible, nothing the Vanilla Ice's character dies in the beginning of this relationship gives her any reason to spend any time with him. Right. I think the only reason why she's probably enamored by him is because he's different. I guess so. And But I, I would be know. turned off by all the it's other stuff that happened. Like know. the fact that, yeah, you almost got her killed by, you know, because horse accidents are dangerous. <laughs> yeah, she could have, like, broken her spine. Two, he steals her organizer with money inside. Like, she had some check or something that she yeah, was trying yeah. to find. Yeah, I, I think he was... organizer, which he just, stole. I understand that, but he so probably not, was trying to figure out who she was. But the fact that she just gently forgives that is stupid as well. Some and of the stuff later on, too, like when... A, you know, a lot of the... I know that she's 18, but it was just a lot of... Um, hit. But she has perfect scores on her SATs, and she's like this prodigy Getting ready type of to person. go to He's college. going to go to college. And yet, you know, even though her dad is saying, this guy's probably connected with these guys who are trying to get us in the family, <laughs> which we haven't talked about. Yeah. And there are obvious connections that she could make to believe that that was true, even though it's not. She's not making those connections, right? Like, so, I don't know, like, when she gives him a ring during that that whole thing. Yeah, I was like, that is a wedding ring. (laughs) She gives him a ring, which is weird. And at some point, when Johnny is told not to come back, he sneaks into her bedroom. And that's another thing that she should not be fucking forgiving, is her him sneaking into the bedroom of someone that... You don't know this fucking person. And you let him sneak in and wake you up with an ice cube in your mouth? Yeah. And then you're, like, going to change in front of him? Right. Like, two seconds later? I was like, your parents are (laughs) old. I don't know. Well, I don't know if they were, but the brother certainly was, because he walked in, like, two seconds later and stopped it from happening. I was always thinking about, like, the parents, and I'm like, wouldn't you... I don't know. I mean, I don't know how... I'm not going to, like, bash, like, parental... It's like, like how they're they're gonna be a parent to their eighteen year old daughter. They were like, oh, they she's... didn't seem like they're bad parents. Like no. any time that they sort of like chastise her for behavior is more out of her safety rather right. than like for her doing something but like they, bad, quote like, unquote, because of the even whole stuff he... which we haven't talked about. Yeah, <laughs> even when he comes to the door, he wouldn't he? I know he's like never see my daughter ever again, but he still comes anyways. Yeah, but wouldn't he? 
the dad be like, hey, I thought I said to never come here again. And it's like no one really... No one acts the way you expect them to act. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, oh, yeah, so the the ring thing, right? So, yeah, she gives him the ring while they're out at the construction site, and then he sneaks back in at some point, throws the ring into the fishbowl that she has in her room before leaving town. She could easily think, and, like, her brother is gone, like, in the next scene, and, like, she knows that he's been kidnapped. She could use that ring in the fishbowl as, like, a sign that he was with the kidnapper. But you could make that. He's you could make person. that visual connection. Yeah, yeah. But he's a good person in her eyes. Very true. But then afterwards, when he gives them the envelope with yeah. the tape inside, it's like, here, this is for you. Yeah. To, like she doesn't see him picking it up off the porch. Right. He just see. She just sees him giving the envelope with the tape, saying, "We have your son." Basically. Yeah. Why would she not think that she's with? Because she knows him after two days of hanging out with him. Exactly. he's a good guy. Yes. Yup, yup. I mean, he's the hero. He said it. Why would he say get with the hero if he's not the hero? <laughs> All right, we can get to the other subplot about these. <laughs> yeah, we're saying subplot, but it's really the plot, right? Yeah, yes. Like, honestly, like, Vanilla Ice... There's Trying nothing to get the for him girl to do. is there's, the plot. Yeah, there's know. nothing for him to do. It's all about, like, this whole thing with Cat and the family, and Vanilla Ice just happens to be there, and he'll participate. <laughs> and that's what this is. Um, and so, <laughs> so... So we have Cat, and then uh, her brother Tommy. Um, <laughs> we have uh, Grace and Gordon as the parents, and they are found by some thugs who saw a TV interview with Cat and Gordon, the dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are coming to him to shake him down for $500 million. <laughs> yeah. And they are basically saying, you need to have this money to us within 24 hours or else. Which is a completely empty threat because way more than 24 hours happens before right. anything else happens to this they... family kidnap his son and then give him another 24 hours right <laughs> and so like wouldn't you uh i mean if you were in new jack city world you would have been dead i don't know yeah. like after that 24 hours there, like, what's the or else i don't <laughs> or know. else we'll give you another 24 hours that's basically what it seems to be i mean because there's a lot of dialogue in here that indicates that there's been multiple days passing but like these are not competent thugs clark and morrissey yeah they're, they're they doing the stakeout like... but they're right out front and they're outside of the car just like eating and drinking I, I, maybe they're trying to p- specifically intimidate him yeah and it's not like to be hiding but they don't talk to him until later on but the, okay long story short basically the family is in witness protection but the kids don't know that the, right. the, they were pregnant with kathy who is the oldest daughter um, at the time that they went into witness protection because Gordon used to be a cop. These two thugs are corrupt cops who were sent away to prison and now they're back to claim money that they think that Gordon had from whatever operation his partner was involved in or something. Yeah. They don't really fully explain like right. where what went down and yeah, like I, I still don't where they know. think this money came from or <laughs> yeah. why he would have it, but that's what's happening. Um, but yeah, and, and, and for some reason, the family's like, don't call the cops, right? Like the wife is like, don't call wouldn't, the cops, don't contact the cops. But they're but in like, witness protection. Wouldn't they still be? Yeah, wouldn't they have a contact within yeah. witness protection to say, hey, someone found me. Yeah, help me out. Yeah, I don't understand. And like, they aren't corrupt. Right? That's the whole no. point. Is like supposedly they are not corrupt. They helped. So why would the cops not help them if they're being intimidated? What would be the problem with telling the cops the story about how you are in witness protection? Mm-hmm. Nothing makes sense about what's going on here. Well, you already told you, like, Tommy gets kidnapped and then, um, <laughs> what's his face has to save the day. Vanilla Ice and his motorcycle buddies have to save the day. Right. The family listens to this tape and it's Tommy saying... I'm somewhere, and these two guys <laughs> took me, and yeah. I'm okay right now, but I'm not going to be okay soon unless you do what they say type of thing. Yeah. In 24 hours, I will not be okay. Yeah. Like, that's almost verbatim what's said. And, um, 
I don't know why they put it like on Kathy's shoulders like she's got to find him or something. And then Kathy tells Vanilla Ice about it. They didn't put it on Kathy's shoulders. Kathy snatched the tape out of her dad's hands like, and ran so away she, to like, Vanilla Ice who knew that he could help or hoped that he could help. Right. Again, instead of going to police. She's like, I'll figure this out. But it seems like she's the one that has to, like, do it. Because her parents are like, we don't know what to do. She's like, I'll fucking take this tape. I don't know. Yeah. It, it, and I try think to do something. It's about trying you, to prove that he is not, are not part of the operation. Because they're, con- you know, the parents are right. convinced. And again, they're not saying, like, don't hang out with Vanilla Ice because he's a bad guy. We think he's a bad guy because we saw him talking to the two thugs outside of our house. Yeah. And, and that's why they think they're connected is because they had a conversation, but nobody knew who the other one was. It's yeah. just like, hey, where where can I get to the nerd club? Can you tell me how to get to Sugar Shack Club? Mm-hmm. And, you know, these guys are also out-of-towners, and they were just fucking with them. Yeah. But that's what Gordon saw out the window. He's like, oh, these three are in cahoots. They're talking to And each other. my daughter's being targeted by this guy, you know. This very inconspicuous looking person with the <laughs> big, big spiked frosted tip hair and, you know, the, the words shavings. on the leather jacket and everything. Very, very covert operation. And then, I don't even know what, but then Nick arrives, her boyfriend slash ex-boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, he's been beat up a couple times. And he Tommy was beat up by Vanilla Ice. On, yeah, because Tommy wants to ride on the motorcycle, and so finally Johnny's like, okay, let's have a ride on the motorcycle, and Tommy That's... flicks Nick off. <laughs> yeah, that was the <laughs> funniest like... part in the entire movie. Yeah, probably. He's flicking him off. And, you know... Yeah, and then, I mean, the father also doesn't want the daughter to be with Vanilla Ice because... He's also the reason why Nick is in the hospital. And she, and they're like, why didn't you go visit your boyfriend in the hospital? Yeah, yeah, because like, no one really knows how much of a her dick and his Nick friend, is. Yeah, yeah, no Nick one sees Nick lies that. to everyone else about yeah, what happened. Yeah, it's the typical douchey, yeah. preppy guy. It's what you see in pretty much every romantic comedy. Right. It's like, oh, you're with this guy who looks great on the surface, but when you actually get him in private, right. he's like how dare you do this, do what I say, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, her, she tr- she quotes, like, spends, like, two days with Vanilla Ice, and then, like, quote, breaks up with him or whatever. Yeah, which like, Nick was talking about at the very beginning of the movie, too. He's like, right. oh, well, when we both go away to college, it's going to be long distance, we're probably going to end up breaking, you know. Right. He's, like, trying to, like, approach the issue in some right. way. Like we're probably breaking up, and if that's what you want, then be going whatever. To different yeah. colleges, I guess. Yeah. And um, like her, her friends and his friends are like, you didn't even visit him at the hospital, and blah blah blah. So everyone's telling her not to hang out with Vanilla Ice. Mm-hmm. So they like don't see each other for one whole day, basically. Yeah. And then, um, Tommy. He skips Little League just to go hang with Vanilla Ice to be on his bike. And, you know, Nick was like, oh, I saw him with that guy with Vanilla Ice. Like, he doesn't really even say, like, right. and then Tommy his gets, name. Yeah, and Tommy gets kidnapped and people didn't so they know. Think, so, yeah. again, it's they're all, very reasonable. They're all thinking Vanilla Ice is a bad guy when she's the only one who's like, no, he's a good guy. So she takes that tape and goes to where he's staying which is around the corner Mm -hmm. and they listen to this tape and vanilla ice is the one that like finds out that um tommy is in that construction site area where they hung out at like two days before or something because he recognizes the sound in the background he's like what's that sound and everyone's like what sound even though you can hear a tapping sound yeah he's a master audio analyzer at this point he just plays the audio back by the way the bikes are ready at this point they were about to skip town because the bikes are now finally fixed they were gonna go but then kathy shows up yeah but anyway they go to the construction site 
And this also shows how dumb the criminals are, right? So, um, they're like, you know, they have the flashlight inside this quasi-built house. Yeah. And they're like flashing it out the window a whole bunch of <laughs> times, too. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like flashing in the kid's face, like, eh, you're with us now. Eh, eh, eh. Yeah. And like, it's like some Home Alone like, why type. why is everyone stupid in this like, movie? They're like the whatever bandits. You know, the wet bandits? The wet bandits, yeah. yeah. They don't do much other than they take a kid and then but flash then a flashlight around. Dumb. I so, don't know. <laughs> anyway, the the four people on the bikes, you know, the, the crew, the ice, the VIPs, I don't know if they're called that in this, but that's what his posse was, right? So, yeah, I guess. Um, you know, they crash through the wall of the building and then start to beat up the the bad guys and good thing tommy wasn't right next to the wall that they crashed into because he right. sure was pretty close um and then they strap and then they have a bunch of the fight two scenes. bad guys on a car like <laughs> yeah their car i guess uh yeah probably the thug's car yeah because i was like car, okay, they, they returned back. back and they returned tommy to the parents and let me and also say, like, during... strap the two bad guys on their own car that Vanilla Ice is driving. Uh, while all this is happening, again, to sort of reiterate the point that this is not meant for teenagers, really. Because it's, it's, it's like a Saturday morning cartoon, the way, like, when they're chasing the boy around the house, and also during this fight scene, there's all kinds of, like, weird, wacky sound effects, and, like, swishes, and synth oh, noises, yeah. and stuff like that. So it's like... They're bringing a Saturday morning cartoon mentality to all these potentially serious things to lighten it up. So it could be digestible for, like, an eight-year-old. Right. And they, they even play, like, the video game. Like, when Tommy is playing a video game, they play the video game noises, like, really yes. loud. So yeah, they, you they, know they, that he's playing. They don't show... Well, they show him playing football. They show the a couple football, screens, but yeah. But they don't show him playing Super... Uh, Super Mario Brothers three, right? Even but though it by is the, the noise, legitimate sound effects, which you can is hear the nice. the sound effects of it, and you're like, oh, he's playing that. Yeah. But also, like, when they whenever they show the crew at that crazy house, it's always like circusy type music. Yeah. Anytime there isn't like a legitimate song that's playing in this movie, the score is. Yes, like, like circus do, 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 do. It's like them doing random stuff because they're bored, waiting for the bikes to be fixed. And then showing the older couple trying to figure out how to fix the bikes. Right. And they're playing that type of music. And, and Okay, so the music was done by Stanley Clark. And I'm really, really interested in what he does with the other two 1991 movies that he did. And I wonder how much he purposefully kind of like biffed this soundtrack. So he's Emmy nominated for Pee Wee's Playhouse, so he has that kind of mm. playful stuff, right? But here are the other two movies he did in 1991. The Five Heartbeats oh. and Boys in the Hood. Huh. So I know that those are not going to be over-the-top cartoony bullshit. Did he do that on purpose? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, Stanley Clark, I don't know. Uh, you have no reason to listen to this, but let me, like, you know, reach out to us. Like, did you kind of, like, sabotage this score a little bit? Like, on purpose? Just kind of, like, knock Vanilla Ice down a peg? Mm. You know, because, I mean, look, Vanilla Ice does not have the best reputation in the rap industry. No. He didn't back then. Like, he obviously, he opened for a whole bunch of people, uh, big names, and then he went on tour with MC Hammer, who also does not have the best reputation in the rap industry. Um, he was super popular, but he was considered to be sort of like a sellout. Vanilla Ice, a lot of cultural appropriation is associated with his shtick. Oh, yeah. Um, also, just the fact that he's, you know, more style than substance, right. generally speaking. Um, so a lot of people just don't like his music or his vibe. And so I wonder if, you know, that's, that's a personal theory, that Stanley Clark may be kind of... Uh, took that to heart and, <laughs> and messed with the score that's what i want to have uh in my mind um anyway back to the end of the plot right so, <laughs> sorry yeah. after so, that little diversion tommy's returned safely the thugs are tied up to the car um 
Everyone's this ready is, to go. Yeah, and then, I, yeah, the crew is ready to go. <laughs> yeah. And then th- another thing that bothered let's me. Let's G-O. Yeah, let's G- <laughs> I like a lot of what he said, though. Yeah, like, I'm cool. going to go schling my schlong. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm just going to go across the street and schling my schlong. <laughs> like, all these things. I'm like, I'm, I'm laughing at that. And, like, know. when the dad, like, thanks him for, like, returning his son, he's like, thanks. Like, that's all Michael, okay, Michael Gross played to dad. Like, right. He's like, thanks. That's all he says is thanks. And Vanilla Ice's response is, doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> and no further conversation, but, your honor. That's it. So then Kathy leaves with their group. Yeah. And the parents are like, okay, see you. Yeah. <laughs> they don't care that she's gonna go I know he's redeemed himself he's the good guy but okay I know okay so after all this Villanel Ice is like so what are you gonna do college girl and she's like well I don't have to go to college just now mm-hmm. so yeah, is she gonna, gonna spend tomorrow. the summer with him only and then go to college I guess so because her parents are like yeah okay goodbye yeah and then they go. And then they go. <laughs> they well, G.O. They G.O. But actually first, Vanilla Ice forgot something. Oh, yeah. All right. He forgot something. Because they start to go, and then they turn around, and he jumps over Nick's Corvette. End of movie, basically. And then they and drive then they, off. And then you're in another club where Vanilla Ice and his crew, or, or Johnny, I'm sorry, is rapping. Yeah. And singing a song about fucking a whole bunch of strange women. Um, <laughs> while Kathy is like... While Kathy is like dancing. grooving in the audience. Yeah. End of movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's a weird one. Uh, a lot more we could talk about if we really wanted to. Like how, you know, how awkward the dialogue is when it exists. And how there's so many unnatural pauses and things like that. How little motivation there is for so many of these different things. Um... The only thing I'll really say is, like, we could also compare this movie to a whole bunch of other movies in terms of, like, the soundtracks. I actually kind of didn't mind that opening song. What, Cool as Ice? Yeah. Yeah, I don't hate it. I don't hate I it like either. It. Like that, okay, as much shit as I'm giving Vanilla Ice in this whole thing... <sighs> I mean, he's got, like, three hits. He's, yeah. <laughs> okay, I like Cool as Ice more than I like Ice Ice Baby. Oh, as a okay. song. As a song. I like Cool As Ice more than I like. I think it's... He's not terrible as a lyricist in terms of, like, constructing songs, but he just has the same fucking flow all the time. I'm getting, like, music criticism now, right? I don't mm-hmm. know. <laughs> like, it, he just has, like... I don't, like... The same delivery every single time. And again, no substance. But, I mean, I don't know. Whatever. I'm not gonna buy his album. No. I'm not gonna buy this soundtrack, which is, I'm sure, what... I would buy the soundtrack for other songs. Yeah, other the ones. other songs that were in it, I really like. And then I do like Cool As Ice. His other songs, like the People's Choice or whatever. And Which is also on here, yep. I was like, eh, I don't really care about that. No, or the weird-ass ballad that he had. That Never Wanna Be Without You. Ugh, like, he was, was just so trying bad. to be... Everyone was had like trying to be like R- R&B. Yeah, everyone had to have that. And, like, not too many people can pull it off. Like, all rappers had to have that. Yeah. Like, LL Cool J. LL Cool J could pull it off. (laughs) Yeah. That's the only (laughs) one, He pulled it off frequently. (laughs) Yeah. And then he had the other one, like, at the Sugar Shack Club. Oh, man, that nerdy band. Yeah, the People's Choice was the song. Oh, is that what? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Because I wrote down the name of the song that the nerdy band was playing because he used the same sample or, or... It was like, thank you for letting me be myself. Yeah. But the nerdy band is credited as thank you, and then in parentheses... Fletten me as Fletten one word <laughs> be mice elf again. Let's G O to the cast and crew then. Uh, already talked about David Cog. David Sten, who wrote this, he's a producer and writer for actually some decent stuff. Uh, 21 Jump Street, Beverly Hills 90210, The L Word, Boardwalk Empire, uh, Hill Street Blues. Uh, we also have a couple other appearances by some people who are kind of known, but don't really have much to do. Like a couple cameos, I guess is the best way to say. It. We got Bobby Brown who plays like Monique, who they mentioned a bunch in this movie mm-hmm. of like a possible, you know, other love interest. She basically gives him his number to be, 
gives Johnny her number at the very beginning. That was played by Bobby Brown, who is known for like the Cherry Pie video and Great White videos and Last Action Hero. So um, she was like the one like white girl who was like dancing in her bra at the very beginning of the movie. Uh, and then you also have Naomi Campbell in the opening scene as like the club singer. Yeah. Which is kind of weird to see. She probably had some relationship with David Kellogg or something and was like brought in as like a favor or something. I don't know why she would be there. Um, I mean, wasn't she also at the end? No, that was a different oh. person. Yeah. So that wasn't like a different. So that yeah, was just she was not part was... of the crew. Then, but when they at the end they have additional crew because they have like five to six other people dancing and then more singers and I was like who. And yeah, then where you do these people come from? Yeah, like, are like, they missing gigs like this? So, yeah, like they don't talk about like is like who are these people? And then, but then, what did Jazz Princess? Because I didn't see them on stage at the end when right. he, like what did they? Who are they? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question that they don't. Unless they're address. just like his friends that just roll around with him. I guess so. Yeah, there's really no. There's no understanding of like what this dude does or like you know again like oh, we need to get out of here because I'm going to miss my show or nothing yeah. like that. No exposition. But yeah. Uh, anyway, Jazz is played by Deezer D, which we confused <laughs> the character name with the actor name. Uh, he's known for CB4, Fear of a Black Hat. Um, probably best known to most people from ER, mm-hmm. Nurse Malik McGrath for 190 episodes. And he unfortunately passed early uh, January 2021 from a heart attack. Uh, there's actually quite a few ER connections. Kristen Minter is also possibly best known for this besides ER. Mm-hmm. Uh, she played Randy Fronzak. Is that how you pronounce it? For yeah. 71 episodes? Yeah, I know who she is. Uh, but she was also on Home Alone, or in Home Alone, um, probably just in the opening scene with all the kids. Like a sister? Yeah, something one like that. Of, sister one... or cousin or something. Um, but as far as we can tell, she's not related to Kelly Joe Minter. But it's our fourth fourth Minter movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Another ER connection. Michael Gross, who played the dad. He was also on six episodes of ER. Just wanted to mention that really quickly. You probably all know him from Family Ties or the Tremors series. He's the only actor to appear in every single Tremors movie wow. that has been released so far, as well as the TV series. Um, and he's also in the 1991 movie In the Line of Duty, Manhunt in the Dakotas. So we'll get to see him again. The uh, The mom was played by Candy Clark. She's an Oscar nominee for American Graffiti. Um, she also played Buffy's mom in the movie version of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, she's also known for Man Who Fell to Earth, Amityville, 3D, Cat's Eye, and she has been a whole bunch of stuff like that. Princess was played by Allison Dean. I'm kind of jumping all around. She was best known as playing Patrice in Coming to America. Mm-hmm. The sister, um, who was one of the few people who did not return for the sequel, I'm just realizing. No. Which is weird. Um, they didn't really, they only showed her dad. Yeah, I mean, Louis Anderson came back. <laughs> you know, they, they brought him over. I mean, I, like, almost everybody. Her dad, Louis Anderson. They had, like, random people from the club scenes. They in didn't the bring back, like, Eric but LaSalle. He specifically didn't want to. Declined. So maybe... Uh, so maybe she did too, and I just don't know about it. But, right. Um, she's also been in Speed 2, and she'll also be in a 1991 movie called Without a Pass. Uh, Sir D, I don't really know what he's been in, because I think IMDb is mixing the credits up of him with another person by his name, Kevin Hicks. There's a bunch of people named Kevin Hicks. The stuff that I found under the name and like the one picture that's in there shows a white guy. <laughs> and Sir D was not a white guy. Right. So... It's possible that Kevin Hicks was in Rent a Kid and also one episode of FX the series, maybe, but it's really tough for me to know if something got mixed up there. And also, um, Nick's IMDb page, IMDb page also has some errors in there. John Newton is the name of the actor. They have him listed as winning nine different Grammy Awards for Best Choral Performance, Best Engineered Album Classicals. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. He went on to have a good you know, yeah. career in music production. No, completely different John Newton. Much older person. Um, this John Newton is an actor who was in Melrose Place, the Untouchables TV series, 
And he also played Superboy uh, slash Clark Kent in a 1988 TV series, which I vaguely remember existing. Roscoe and May, the ones who were in the the barn, the, you know, the couple fixing the, the bike. Um, we'll talk about Roscoe later on. We've already seen him in Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead as Franklin, mm -hmm. which we didn't really talk about in the episode, but he was there. He's in like seven other 1991 movies, so we'll talk about him later. Uh, May was played by Dodie Goodman. This is her only movie for this year. She's known for, uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's actually not right. She's also in the 1991 movie Samantha. Um, she is probably best known to people of our age as playing Miss Miller in Alpha and the Chipmunks. Um, she is also an Aunt Drummond in Different Strokes. She's been on Grease 2. She's been on 325 episodes of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. And she's a comedian from the days of the Jack Parr Tonight Show in 1957, all throughout the 70s. So she's been around for a long, long time. Tommy was played by Victor DiMattia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He played Timmy Timmons in The Sandlot. Mm -hmm. He also played Dennis the Menace in a 1987 TV movie. Uh, he's also been a radio flyer and Turner and Hooch. So you've probably seen him if you're a kid of our era. Um, I liked his performance. I, I liked him. Yes. I don't like he was the best person. <laughs> yeah. He was my favorite character out of all the people in this movie. Yeah, I mean, I think Roscoe and May had the potential for it, but all their scenes were basically the same. Of, it was just them trying oh, to figure out. Oh, you're fixing this thing yeah. right. Oh, yes, I am, woman. Like, it was that yeah. kind of thing 30 yeah. times. So, um, but yeah, again, like, honestly, most of the acting isn't too terrible. It's just vanilla ice. Um, it was extremely stiff as Johnny. We'll see him again in TMNT2, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, doing the ninja rap. Uh, he... <laughs> he has since gone on to become an Adam Sandler favorite, starting with That's My Boy. Yeah. Uh, in a pretty good role. That yeah. Was, that was, if you want to watch I mean, he a likes... good Vanilla Ice movie, watch <laughs> That's My Boy, because that's surprisingly funny. I mean, he does know how to make fun of himself. Yes. Like, he, he knows yeah. that he was a has-been, I guess. And... Yeah, he knows how to take advantage of his... Um, pop culture status yeah for sure which is which is good that's that's important to know honestly that's a big reason why so, so that's i mean that's sort of how neil patrick harris sort of got in the limelight it was like making fun of his public persona like in the harold and kamar movies and stuff like that oh yeah and then he became yeah because everyone's like calls him doogie even though he's been in like how I Met Your Mother as a totally different person. Yeah, but that, you know, that sort of came after he was willing to accept people making fun of him. Right, do, yeah. Right? So Vanilla Ice has sort of tried to do the same thing. Um, so we went on to do that, That's My Boy, uh, Ridiculous Six, Sandy Wexler, and Wrong Missy, all, again, Happy Madison Productions. Yeah. Right, so um, he was also in The Surreal Life back in 2004, if you remember that. Yeah, I do. In 1991, he was on Circus of the Stars. <laughs> Uh, okay. Where Leslie Nielsen was the ringmaster, we should watch that at some point if that's available. Other other quick 1991 TV appearances for Vanilla Ice. He was a musical guest for one episode of SNL that Joe Montina hosted, uh, and also he does have 1991 trading cards uh, from two different sets: music cards and then also the Yo MTV Raps set. He is also appearing in awards. Let's go to the awards. We already talked about a couple of them. Uh, it was nominated for the Stinker's Bad Movie Award for Worst Picture, but that lost to Nothing But Trouble, so we got that to look forward to. Um, in terms of the Razzie nominations, uh, it was nominated for Worst Picture, lost to Hudson Hawk, already talked about actor, director, lost to Michael Lehman for Hudson Hawk, screenplay, lost to Hudson Hawk, <laughs> and then original score, uh, original song, Cool as Ice, was nominated for a Razzie. I don't think that should have been nominated. Uh, yeah, probably should it's not have been. the song. But uh, MC Hammer, his former I mean, that, tour partner, that, Adam's Groove, was the winner. That song is the, the worst song. And deserves to get the worst <laughs> song. <laughs> I don't know well, why they didn't you, put, like, looking... Ramsey up there. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what about Suburban, Suburban Commando? Suburban Commando. That, those songs are worse than Cool as Ice. Yeah. 
even probably worse than the Adams Group. <laughs> yeah. Um, MTV Movie Awards. There is one little thing mentioned, but no major awards. It was part of one of those, you know, commercial bumper things. You know, mm-hmm. the showcases. Fake nominee of Best Inanimate Objects. So I don't know what inanimate objects would be considered is... What was his bike? I'm thinking either they went, like, more literal with the bike. Maybe the fishbowl. But I'm also thinking, like, what if they kind of went more mean-spirited and just said Vanilla Ice himself? Oh. Uh, like, so, he, his acting was so bad that he was, like, an inanimate right. object. So, again, I mean, the, we'll put the I, call I out. I want to see this. <laughs> yeah, if anyone out there has a copy of this MTV Movie Awards, the 1992 MTV Movie Awards, let us know so we can watch these things. Um, we're still looking for a copy. Shall we move on to true crime and pop culture? So I'm just going to talk about um, Vanilla Ice's legal issues. Okay. And then I do have a couple of pop culture things at some point if we need. Oh, about him? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I I found this just, you know, through IMDb or, like, Wikipedia or just reading random articles. I also read that he's just not a nice guy. <laughs> I Because I, I read, I was trying to find out um, where this movie was filmed. And it was filmed in the outskirts of L.A. In a suburb of L.A. And, um... There was this one website where it showed, like, where that crazy house is, the farm, but it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't look like that, how you see it in the movie. Sure. That house. So don't, because the, it was like, uh, this website was made by a person that was like, here's the address of that house, but don't go there because it's not going to be decorated that way. (laughs) There was a couple comments that I read that made me laugh. Where they were like, oh, yeah, they were filming in my town when I was a kid. And I remember Vanilla Ice not being that nice of a dude. (laughs) He's probably bothered all the time back then, though, too. Probably. I mean, because I think it was people who were kids that were trying to get his autograph and he was, like, not into it. Mm -hmm. So they thought he was not nice. And then there was another comment that made me laugh. And he said, I remember he had hairy fingers. (laughs) 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 I was like, okay. All right, I'll get into his legal issues. <laughs> Starting August 1988, Vanilla Ice was arrested in South Dallas for illegal drag racing. And probably on a motorcycle. Yeah, probably. In 1990, Vanilla Ice was threatened with copy... I mean, this is what I know. This is the only thing I knew about like his legal issues. Mm-hmm. was, you know, he was threatened with copyright infringement for the use of the samples of Under Pressure by Queen and David Bowie. But that was settled out of court. And I was trying to find out, like, what uh, what amount it was for, and but I couldn't find it. Yeah, but, oftentimes those things are confidential. Yeah. It's probably like a percentage or something, and they didn't release but it. But I don't know if you remember. I can't, I don't know if oh, this yeah, was on. Oh, yeah, a very famous clip It was on, uh, yeah, and he was like, no, it's dun 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 But ours is dun 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 or something. Like, the, yeah. the way he, we, I enunciate the dun dun in a different part. He's like, there's one extra dun. Dun, yeah. ours. So it's completely I don't know different. if that was on MTV or what, but I remember that interview. <laughs> yeah, there's some famous interview that got pushed around. And I, yeah, I think, didn't that sort of like lead towards how samples were handled in future songs? I think so, because, I mean, like even... It was kind of a landmark case in that way, saying like if you have like eight notes in a row that match or something, then it's a sample and like they a have copyright to be compensated. Yeah. Something along those lines, I think. In June 1991, he was arrested in L.A. on firearm charges after threatening a homeless man with a pistol. And the homeless man's name was James Gregory. And James Gregory had approached Vanilla Ice's car outside of a supermarket and attempted to sell him a silver chain. Vanilla Ice and his bodyguard were charged with three weapons offenses. And Vanilla Ice pleaded, pleaded no contest. To that, like and no jail time or anything no, for that, just probably no. fines or community service. Yeah. 
All right, and then January 2001, Vanilla Ice was arrested by police in Davie, Florida for assaulting his wife, Laura. According to the criminal complaint, Vanilla Ice and his wife argued as they drove on the interstate 595, which is, you know, up and down Florida, I guess. Vanilla Ice admitted to pulling her hair from her head, but it was to prevent her from jumping out of the truck that he was driving. He pleaded guilty to charges of disorderly conduct for four months later and was sentenced to probation and ordered to attend family therapy sessions. So Vanilla Ice's pet Wallaroo, so it's like a wallaby kangaroo. Okay. Bucky. (laughs) And his pet goat Poncho escaped from his wife's grandmother's home in Port St. Lucie, Florida in November 2004 After wandering around local streets for over a week, the animals were caught and returned back to Vanilla Ice, and he had to pay a $220 fine for their expired pet tags. But I was like, can you have a (laughs) wallaroo? Some states have no restrictions. Okay. (laughs) Vanilla Ice appeared in West Palm Beach Court in September 2007 to be arraigned for driving with an expired license. In the months leading up to the court hearing, he had been pulled over for doing 74 in a 45 mile per hour zone. And he had illegally tinted car windows. But it doesn't say anything else. Like, Mm. I mean, he's probably just getting fined for these things. Yeah, yeah. On April 2008, Vanilla Ice was arrested in West or in Palm Beach County on a battery charge for allegedly kicking and hitting his wife. He was released the next day after she gl- declared that he had only pushed her. In court, the couple's neighbor, who goes by the name of Frank Morales, stated that it was merely a verbal argument. Vanilla Ice was ordered by Florida court to stay away from his wife following his arrest and to communicate with his children only through their neighbor, Frank Morales. And 2015, February 2015, Vanilla Ice was arrested and charged with residential burglary and grand theft after he allegedly stole furniture, a pool heater, bicycles and other items from a Florida home that he thought to be vacant. He later accepted a plea deal, which would result in his charges being dropped following his completion of 100 hours of community service. I think that was, you know how he has his own, I don't know if they still do it, but he had his own like... Yeah, the home renovation show. Yeah, Yeah. it was probably because of that. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, they're trying to find, like, cheap supplies for the show. And they're like, oh, here's this abandoned home. Let me take all the furniture. (laughs) Right. So as of April, or no, October 19th, 1991, I'll do the top five, because I think some of these are newish. Yeah, we haven't always done the top five, so. Yeah, Yeah, because some of these songs, I'm like, I don't know if we talked about them yet. But uh, number one was Emotions by Mariah Carey. That was the first week on the charts. And so it debuted at number one. Yeah. Number two is Do Anything by Natural Selection. Number three is Romantic by Karen White. And then number four is Wholehearted by Extreme. That's a new... That seems new. Yeah. yeah. And then number five is Something to Talk About by Bonnie Raitt. Also hmm. new didn't realize that was 91. Yeah, me neither. And, um, TV. So I found... If you were one of the many people not watching Cool as Ice in the theater... Right. I don't know if I saw it opening day. (laughs) I know I saw it. (laughs) So this uh, October 18th was a Friday, so it was the typical... Yeah, TJF stuff. Yeah. So, it was Family Matters, Step by Step, Perfect Strangers, Baby Talk. And then we have on CBS, Brooklyn Bridge, which we've talked about before. Yep. Princesses, which we've talked about before. Mm-hmm. 
And then a show that I have not heard of called The Palace Guard. That's a show? Yes. That sounds like it would be like a TV movie. I th- it was debut. This is the debut of this TV show, and it was the first two. It was pilot part one, pilot part two. Okay. So it was two hours. So yeah. it could have been a movie. And or it was like a busted pilot type of a thing it, that aired once. It probably could have been, but it it lasted. F- I'm reading about this. It lasted five episodes. So these two, okay. and then three, three more, more. <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then the rest of the season did not air. So, and there was like 10 episodes. Yeah. So they only showed like half. But it is a show about Tommy Logan, who is played by D.W. Moffat. Do you know who that is? The name sounds familiar, but I can't place the face right now. I know him from like Friday Night Lights. Okay. So, it stars Tommy Logan, who's played by D.W. Moffat, who's an expert jewel thief who has just gotten out of jail. He is hired by Arturo Taft as a security expert for his hotels around the world. It goes into a little further where Tommy Logan, he served three years in prison for jewelry theft. He's released on parole and he accepts an offer to become the head of security for this posh palace hotel, which, you know, mm-hmm. palace guard. Mm-hmm. And it's a hotel chain. And the two reasons why he was, he takes this job is because he previously enjoyed great success in stealing from high class clientele. And he thought it would be a way to understand how to prevent others to do this. This it what sounds really dumb. <laughs> I that's why it only How lasted you, like five episodes. Yeah, who would have thought it wouldn't last? And then Artur his boss Arturo Taft is played by Tony Lo Bianco. I don't know him. No. But he was in the Honeymoon Killers. He was in the French Connection. And then. The other woman, the other character in this is Christy, the character's name is Christy Cooper, played by Marcy Walker, and she is mostly known for being in the show Santa Barbara, the soap. Sure. She was also in All My Children, so she just did soaps. Trying the primetime thing. Yeah, and it didn't do well. Yeah, there's so many shows that you mentioned on here that, like, we've never heard of or just don't recall that sound kind of interesting and be like, oh, that'd be fun to watch an episode like or this two. Ju- I mean, jewelry thievery there's... stuff, I don't know. It's kind of like watching, you but know, it sounds like, like oh, that's gonna have Ocean's Eleven. So I have a couple things for Vanilla Ice, pop culture-wise. One is that, um, so I know we've had a couple movies that have uh, video game adaptations. Oh, Okay. This one kind of almost not really did. Vanilla Ice almost had his own Game Boy game. So there is a uh, finished, completely finished game that was unreleased called Rap Quest that was supposed to be a Vanilla Ice tie-in to his career. Um, At some point they had to change the name of the character to Cool Q, but it still never got released. Um, But... The ROM is out there. If you wanted to download it, you could possibly do that. We'll have a link on the website to uh, a review of this game called Rap Quest. The main plot of it is the Noise Boys have stolen the CDs from Rap City and you have to get them back. But, uh, yeah, so it was really... Vanilla Ice was supposed to have his own game at some point. So we'll have a link to the the video of that. Um, Check out Game Boil on YouTube. Uh, And then also, Vanilla Ice had his own board game. Did you know that? No. In 1991. Uh, Vanilla Ice Electronic Rap Game. We'll have the link to a board game geek page. Uh, It comes with a beatbox speaker that looks like a microphone, um, which will play a beat for you, and then you're supposed to basically like freestyle rap on this board game thing. I also found a clip of uh, Jimmy Fallon playing it as part of like a failed board game segment he did back uh, a few years back. So we'll put that on the website as well. uh, So you can see what it looks like in action along with a couple of the other board games he featured in that segment. So 
Yeah, Vanilla Ice was everywhere in 1991, and again, we're not done with them. We'll see him doing a ninja rap at some point in the future. So let's G.O. to rankings and ratings. Mm -hmm. On your one to five star scale, where would you put Cool as Ice? I'm going to give this a two. Two. That's not bad. That's probably pretty fair. Yeah, I'm going to say on my zero to four star scale, I'm going to give it a one, and that's mostly because of like the visuals of the whole thing. If it had any sort of semblance of a story, then it might even get higher. If Vanilla Ice was a better actor at the time, it would have gotten <laughs> higher. But yeah, I, I'm going to give it like a, what did I say, a one? I don't even remember anymore. I was saying it's a one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Every movie's worth watching once. Would you watch this again? Uh, sure. Yeah. I think I would too. Like it's, again, it's sort of like Suburban Commando-ish or Rock and Roll High School wise where like it's not a good movie but it's still like fun for the wrong reasons or maybe yeah. that's you know maybe those are the right reasons i did read people. that the riff riff tracks did a thing on this movie oh yeah like an episode or whatever yeah that'd be fun to see what they do with it um but it, it's there was like a midnight showing for the pic- kind of yeah. like oh yeah the room fun. or something and people are throwing like i don't even know what <laughs> People bring, ice cubes that would be yeah, dangerous. I don't know about ice that. cubes up in the air. Bike parts. Um, peanut butter, pickle, anchovy, mustard, pineapple yeah, sandwiches. Or just saying schlinging a schlong or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you out there want to watch Cool as Ice as it was recording in December 2021, it's available on Tubi, IMDb TV, Con TV, Digital Rental, VHS, or DVD. As always, check your local listings. As for us, you can listen to us on all your major podcasting platforms. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. You can email us at 1991movierewind at gmail.com. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd, and YouTube. Just search 1991 Movie Rewind or go to 1991movierewind.com for the full list of movies along with show notes and more. Next week, we're doing something a little bit weird and different. Uh, we're going to watch a movie that has a release date that's basically the same as the date that we're covering it. So next week, we'll be watching Millions, which is available on VHS and DVD. We will see you then. Thanks. <laughs>